You are watching Christ's Commission Fellowship. Changing lives for eternity. Today, I want to continue our series. What has been our series? Want the one thing. That's our series. Everybody say that with me. One thing, the one thing. What is the one thing? Last week, we discussed Mary's one thing. Mary, what was her one thing? To sit at the feet of Jesus. Today, we are going to discuss David's one thing. Are you ready? Now, before I do that, can I ask you an honest question? Give me an honest mental answer or answer your neighbor, all right? What is your one thing? As of now, what is your one thing? What does it mean, one thing? What do you really want? What do you really want? That's what you are dreaming for. That's what you think about. In fact, you tell yourself, without that, I will not be happy. So what is that one thing in your mind that if you have it, you'll really be happy? That's your one thing. What is it? Are you speaking to me mentally now? <laughs> okay. Can you whisper to your neighbor? If it's secret, don't whisper. If it is not, they can pray for you. What is that one thing? Okay. Now, let me tell you why this is so important. The reason why one thing is so important is simply this. Things which matter most must never be at the mercy of things which matter least. Sometimes you and I are preoccupied with so many things, and the most important thing gets neglected. The next problem is this. Most of us don't even know what is the one thing. Think about it. You are pursuing something, but you may not even be aware of it. Or you are pursuing many things. You may not even be aware of it. This will change your life if you understand what is the one thing. You see, one thing is something that is affected by your knowledge, by your perspective. As Oswald Chamber once said, death, the reality of death, has an amazing power to alter our desires. Let me repeat. Death has an amazing power to alter your desires because it will tell you what is really the most important thing. Just imagine together. You see a couple always fighting about money, about the color of their furniture. They're always fighting. And then suddenly, the husband discovered that he has only 30 days to live. Now think, if you're the husband and you have 30 days to live, what will be the most important thing for you? Will you agree with me? The reality of death has an amazing power to adjust your desires to adjust what is important. Now, the reason why I like this series because I believe there are a lot of Christians who are not really critical thinkers. They don't think strategically. They go through life. They go with the flow. But they don't really focus on what is really the one thing. What is the most important thing? So, today, are you and I ready to discuss the one thing of David, let's find out about David, okay? What is his one thing? Let's read together. <clears throat> one thing I have asked from the Lord. Notice, amazing attitude. I need God to change my heart. I need God to help me. So one thing I've asked from the Lord. He made it a prayer concern that I shall seek. You notice something? To pray does not mean you don't do your part. 
So he's saying, I'm going to ask God to help me. It's all by grace, but I need to do my part. I shall seek. Now, what is David's one thing? Let's read together. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. What was David's one thing? To dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. What does that mean? He wanted intimacy with God. He wanted God's presence. For what purpose? Notice, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in His temple. I'm going to explain that in a short while. But right now, let's all be clear. What was David's one thing? Everybody? To seek intimacy with God. So tell your neighbor, to seek intimacy with God. Now let me ask you, is that your one thing? Let me explain to you why that is really a wonderful thing. Intimacy with God. Because at the end of your life, you cannot bring anything with you. When you die, you leave everything behind. But the reality, if you believe in what the Bible is saying, assuming you believe in the existence of God, you believe that Jesus is real, assuming you do believe, I think this makes sense to seek intimacy with God. For David, one pursuit, one purpose, one preoccupation. For David, I want to seek Intimacy with God. Now, what does that mean, intimacy with God? Why is this so important? Because once you have chosen your one thing, it will affect your entire life. Your direction in life will change. If my direction in life is to seek intimacy with God, that's my North Star, that's my GPS, Everything I do is going to be affected. Now, it does not mean I will never fail. It does not mean I will never sin. However, it does mean when I do fall into sin, when I fail, I recover. Because I know sin is affecting my intimacy with God. So I want to deal with that sin. Exactly like David. You and I know that David failed. Yes or no? Horrible sin. But notice, David recovered. How did he recover? Because of his one thing. I, will, I want to seek intimacy with God. If you read his prayer of repentance in Psalm 51, you will notice his emphasis. Lord, restore to me the joy of my salvation. Lord, give me a new heart because I want intimacy with you. David said in the psalm, when I was hiding my sin, I was so miserable. Therefore, at the end of David's life, look at what God said about David. This is amazing. God described David together, together. I found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart who will do all my will. You see, if your one thing is intimacy with God, God says it's very pleasing to him. Why? Because you want to please him and you will do all of his will. Now, does it mean you will never fail? Of course not. But should it fail, you recover. And you will not live a lifestyle of sin. Look at the opposite of David, King Saul. King Saul never recovered. Because for King Saul, his one thing is about himself. For King Saul, his one thing is about his position. I want to be the king of Israel, no matter what. It is not intimacy with God. Let's read this again. Let me explain. 
Let's repeat this verse, okay? Our message is very simple. What's our message? Seek intimacy with God. Your one thing. What's your one thing? Seek intimacy with God. When I see you this week at the mall, and I ask you, how was the message? What will you tell me? Seek intimacy with God. Don't ever tell me, it's good, it's good. Okay. What's the message? Basta, it's good. <laughs> no, no. So if I were you, I'm going to discuss this message during lunchtime. I'm going to discuss this message during dinner. I'm going to discuss this message with my family members. I'm going to discuss this message with my D group. So I will remember, and we can all apply. Because today, I'm going to describe to you seek intimacy with God. What does it mean? How does it look like? And how do you do it? I'll give you the how. Are we ready? All right. One more time. Everybody, point one, upward. Everybody. Are you pointing upward? All right. The right finger, huh? One. Now, everybody, one, one thing, okay? Now, let's read together. One thing I have asked from the Lord. Remember, David knew, apart from God's power, we cannot be what God wants us to be. Amen? So, prayer is crucial. How do you accomplish the one thing? You begin with prayer. One thing I have asked. Number two, I shall seek. You got to do your part. Don't try to seek for too many things. One thing first. What will you seek? Read. That I, very personal, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord. You see, in the time of David, the temple was not yet built. But you have the tent of meeting. It's the house of the Lord. Where God told Moses, I'm going to meet you in the tent of meeting. This is also a prophetic understanding of David that someday there will be a place of gathering of God's people. So for David, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord, for what purpose? By this time, if you read Psalm 27, you know that David was already the king. Not to stay in the mansion, not to stay in the palace. His one thing is to be in the house of the Lord. To do what? Before I tell you, he says, all the days of my life. What does it mean, all the days of my life? One main preoccupation. Not just one pursuit. Not just one goal. One main preoccupation. All the days of his life. Wow. What will make somebody desire to be in the presence of God? Well, let me give you good news. This is one prayer if you pray today. Today, if you are sincere and you make it your prayer, I guarantee you, you will become intimate with God. Can you tell your neighbor, you can be intimate with God today? For sure. You know why? He gave us a promise. The Bible tells us, God gives a promise. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Ladies and gentlemen, if you seek God with all your heart, he promises you, you will find him. Seeking intimacy is not hard. God is not playing games with us. God is not saying, you know what, I'm so hard to find. pick a -boo. <laughs> No, God is there. He's always there waiting for us. But you've got to search him. You've got to seek him, not search, seek him with all your heart. You have to be sincere. And God knows whether you are sincere or you are not. See, Christianity is about the heart. For David, why did he want to seek God? with all his heart. Why does he want intimacy? What's the message today? Seek intimacy. Why? Let me tell you why. You will not want to be with somebody if every time you're with that person, 
that person is always angry at you or that person discourages you. You don't want to be with, with somebody like that. Do you understand? Are there some people in your life who are KSP? Louder. Yeah, seated beside you. <laughs> but you love them, okay? But the truth is this. People, there are some people you don't like to be with. Yes or no? That's reality. But why did God give you D group members that sometimes you don't like to be with? Can I tell you why? To mold your character. Why is it in a family, some family members are just nice to be with, some not so nice. Do you have those in your family? All right. Why? Because God wants you to grow in your character, in love. But for David, it's different. He wanted God for selfish reason. Do you realize God does not mind if you want him for your own reason? It's a good reason. You know what's the reason? Let me share with you. David wrote this, okay? David said in Psalm 34, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. How blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. You see, people who have not encountered the Lord will not know what you and I are talking about. Why will you seek God if you don't believe he is good? If you don't believe the greatest blessing of God is God himself. But there are collateral blessings. David did not write this psalm in a vacuum. He wrote this in an environment of real challenges. So to understand verse 4, you must go to verse 1, 2, and 3. And that's what we're going to do. For David, he said, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? Notice how personal. Same idea. Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Very personal name of God. The Lord. Yahweh, the Lord, is my light. Number two, he is my salvation. And number three, he is my defense, the defense of my life. What does that mean? Let me explain to you. Intimacy with God means you have learned to see things from God's perspective. The Lord is my light. What enters your mind when you think of the word light? You and I don't appreciate light. I want you to imagine in a place where there's no light. All right? Close your eyes now. Close your eyes. Close. Don't look at me. Close your eyes. Can I tell you something with your eyes closed? You'll notice the darkness in your eyes is not yet even real darkness. Now open your eyes. I visited one of the biggest caves in the world, in Kentucky. It's called Mammoth Cave. When we were brought inside that cave, the guide told us, turn off the flashlight. And when I turned off the flashlight, I have never seen darkness more dark. Absolutely no light. You can't even see anything in front of you. It's like a wall, complete darkness. You know, the Bible tells us, once upon a time, you and I are blind. The Bible says, if our gospel is veiled, if you cannot see it, it is veiled. You know the word veiled from veil, you know, veil, you know, it, it, it's covered. To those who are perishing, they cannot see. In whose case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving. Who is the God of this world? Satan. Satan has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. They're blinded. They cannot see. And the Bible is very clear. The God of this world has blinded the spiritual eyes of the unbelievers. So, ladies and gentlemen, be patient with people who do not know the Lord. Because they don't see what you see. You and I can see exactly the same thing and arrive at totally different conclusions. Let me give you an example. 
If I see the creation, by the way, did you notice the moon last night? How many of you noticed the moon last night? Was it beautiful? How many of you did not see the moon last night? Raise your hand. I feel sorry for you, okay, because you are always in your house. But you know what? Sometimes it's good to go out. I take a walk almost every night. The moon was beautiful, amen? Now, if I see the moon, I see the stars. When I visit beautiful places, I see the mountains, I see the valleys. You know what enters my mind? What an amazing creator we have. Now, somebody else will see. What an amazing evolution we have. You see, when I see animals, when I see the hand of babies, when I see children smiling, wow, when you see babies smile, what an amazing creator we have to give life. But some people will say, well, came from the monkey. Perspective. So, David is saying his eyes was open. Whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. So the first step in intimacy with God so that you have his light is to come to know Jesus. See, Jesus said, I am the, everybody read, I'm the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. You see, the Bible is very clear. Jesus is the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness. So you need to understand now why when your friends do not value Bible study, they don't value worship, they are so busy with something else, be patient. Don't judge them because they are blind. They cannot see. Love them, but don't judge them. They see things differently. You see, intimacy with God comes when you begin to understand, to see things from His light. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. You cannot be intimate with God apart from knowing His word. And that's why intimacy with God means what? Seeing things from God's perspective. The Lord is my light. That's intimacy with God. You begin to see things as God sees it. And then the Lord is my salvation. You see, many people know Jesus as a good man, as a good teacher. But how many of you really know God as your Savior? While David was talking about physical salvation, the New Testament is very clear. God is not just our physical salvation. He saves us completely. Let's read this together. This is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Everybody, read one more time. This is, notice, what is eternal life? Eternal life is knowing, intimacy, knowing the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. And I submit to you, there are many people who think they are Christians, but they are not. You see, you and I have been misled into thinking Christianity is just a mental agreement. I believe in Jesus. The Bible tells us Satan believes in God. Do you understand? The Bible says in the book of James, Satan believes in God. But Satan is not saved. There's a big difference. Intimacy with God. Knowing Him as my Savior. Do you believe Jesus Christ died on the cross for all of your sins? Louder. No, do you really believe? Only 20 of you believe. One more time. How many of you, how many of you really believe when Jesus died on the cross, He died to pay for all of your sins? Raise your hand. Higher, higher. Now, those of you who raise your hands, second question. If Jesus Christ is your Savior, He died for all of your sins, are you sure all your sins are forgiven? If you are sure, raise your hands. Now, if you are sure all your sins are forgiven, 
How many of you are sure you'll go to heaven when you die? Raise your hands. You see the disconnect? Some of you are afraid to raise your hands. You are not connecting. You, you need to be intimate with the Lord. Say, Jesus is my Savior. Say that with me. And if he's your Savior, if you are to die today, what happened to your sins? Paid for, forgiven. That's intimacy with God. People who are not intimate with God will have no assurance of salvation. You don't know. Notice, what else did he say? The Lord is the defense, what? The defense of my life, my protection. This is written in a real situation. Look at what he wrote. When, verse 2, when evildoers came upon me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and my enemies, they stumbled and fall. What you need to learn is pursuing intimacy with God, to seek intimacy with God, does not exempt you, does not exempt me from problems. This guy was living in the midst of problems. I like to believe at this point in his life, his own son betrayed him. There was a rebellion in his kingdom. Notice what he said. Though a host and come against me, my heart will not fear. Though war arise against me, in spite of this, I shall be confident. See, people who are intimate with God have great peace. Because God is your refuge. In the midst of problem, you can have peace. David said, in spite of all of this, I shall be confident. People who are not intimate with God, they get rattled, they fall apart. So, question to you. Do you know the Lord? For David, the Lord is his light. The Lord is his salvation. The Lord is his refuge. And because of that, he will now tell all of us, one thing I have asked from the Lord that I shall seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. You see? Because he understood how precious God is. And what is he going to do? How do you express intimacy with God? It's called worship. To behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. Huh. What does it mean to behold the beauty of the Lord? Can I tell you the word behold? The word for behold means you will gaze. It's a beautiful word to admire, to look intently. Single guys, way but me. Single guys. A few single guys only. Higher, higher. Oh, single. Oh, see, forget singles. Those of you who are married, married guys, raise your hand. When you first encountered your wife to be, you met her. What did you do? Did you just glance at her, or did you learn to gaze, to behold, to look and admire? You see what I'm saying? For David to behold. The beauty. Notice the word beauty. The beauty in the Hebrew language has many meanings. It has to do with the goodness of God. It has to do with the character of God, His mercy, His justice, the perfection of His being. That is the beauty of God, His goodness, His attributes. You know, some people have no idea the beauty of God. You don't have that desire because you don't know Him. And to know Him, you need to worship, to gaze, to behold His beauty, and then to meditate. Now, this word, these are basically synonyms, but the, the word meditate is translated in some of your other Bible to inquire, to ask, to ask for counsel. But the idea of meditate is really 
fellowship, to seek guidance. That is, the, the, all of that is worship. To behold the beauty of the Lord, to admire Him, to inquire, to fellowship with Him. Wow! Let me give you an example to understand this kind of expression of David, to gaze, to behold the beauty of the Lord. There was a person, a lady, who inherited a piece of jewelry. It was passed on to her by her mom. And her mom got it from her mom, from grandparents, grandma, grandma. But she never really took that jewelry seriously. Sometimes she would misplace it. Sometimes she would find it. Well, one day, while trying to fix her drawer, she accidentally saw this piece of jewelry. And she said, you know, out of curiosity, I'm going to have it appraised. So she brought it to a jeweler. And the jeweler began to look. And as he looked, his mouth began to drop. And then his breathing became faster. <gasps> okay? It is something like this image, okay? He began to gaze. He began to look. And then finally, he stopped looking, and he looked at this lady. He said, ma'am, to appraise this piece of jewelry, this stone, this diamond, he said, it is priceless. I cannot give any value. Because in my 30 years in the jewelry business, I have never seen a stone like this. The brilliance, the cut, the technology that was put into it. Ma'am, this is priceless. Now, this illustration was given by Tim Keller. His whole point is this. If you are a girl, how will you treat that piece of jewelry given to you by your mom? Will you treat it half-heartedly? Or will you take that thing so seriously that you will make sure it has the proper casing, you will make sure it is protected, you will make sure it is given its rightful value? Yes or no? Now, let me ask you. Comparing God and Jesus to any piece of diamond, to any piece of jewelry, which one has more value? God. Jesus. And the reason I submit to you that we don't really worship is we don't really know. We are not intimate with God. You see, many of us believe God. But how many of you really know how precious God is? How many of you really, in your heart, you really know the preciousness, how valuable Jesus is, God is, to you and to me? You see, the way you worship tells me what is your understanding with who God is. Whether you worship or you don't worship does not impact the value and the glory of God. It's like somebody who says, the sun is dark. It does not matter. Whether you believe the sun is there or the sun is not there, whether you believe God is good or not, it does not matter. Because by not worshiping Him, we do not diminish His glory. Amen? But how do you worship Him? I love this quotation of worship. Worship is quickening the conscience by the holiness of God. It impacts your entire being. Quickening the conscience of the holiness of God. Feeding the mind with the truth of God. Purging the imagination by the beauty of God. Opening the heart to the love of God and devoting the will to the purpose of God. Let me expand this explanation. One of the best explanations of what true worship is. It impacts your conscience. It impacts your entire being. 
feeding the mind with the truth of God. It impacts your mind because of the truth about God. You cannot worship properly without truth. It impacts your mind. Purging the imagination by the beauty of God. What a beautiful statement. Opening the heart to the love of God. Your entire being is affected by God when you worship Him properly. And devoting the will, the purpose of God. You surrender everything. You see, worship is the proper response to who God is and what He has done for you. If you don't know God, your worship is anemic. If your worship is dry, the problem is you and I don't really understand who God is. But once you know God, your worship will change. So I call this the loop. Intimacy with God will result in worship. Worship will result in greater intimacy with God. For example, what is worship? Once you know who God is, who Jesus is, you give him your all because he has done so much for you. Example, what is worship in the New Testament? I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God. Notice, because of who God is, what he has done, intimacy with God results in something. You will do something. What is that something? To present your bodies a living, holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. See, once I know who God is, what he has done for me, something happens. I want to give him my best. And apparently, your best is give him your life. That's what the Bible is saying. Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. So I call this the loop of intimacy. You know, intimacy with God, when you get intimate with God, you worship. The more you worship, the greater is your intimacy. The greater is your intimacy, you will worship. It's a cycle. You know, if worship is just one thing you do, everything becomes mundane. However, if worship is the one thing we do, everything takes on eternal significance. In other words, what the writer is saying is simply this. If my life is a life of worship to God, everything I do becomes very significant. If I'm a good husband, I do it because I worship God. If I go to the office, I do it because I worship God. If you're a housewife, if you cook, it's because you love God, you worship Him. Everything becomes meaningful. No wonder, how did Mary worship the Lord? When Mary sat at the feet of Jesus, she became so generous. You know why? It affected her entire being. The Bible tells us, what did Mary do? Mary then, last week we learned, how did she worship Jesus? She took a pound of very costly perfume. She gave her best. Very expensive. And the other disciples, especially Judas, what was Judas saying? You are wasting your money. Uh -uh. When you love somebody, when you worship somebody, you give your best. That, my friend, is worship. The same thing happened to David. Because David understood the Lord, he understood the only thing he can respond is worship. So this is what David said. When he was offered a piece of property to build the temple, to build an offering place. You know what David said to Ornan? No, I will surely buy it for the full price. I will not take what is yours for the Lord. To offer burnt offering, which cost me what? Nothing. You see, Christianity today is consumerism. Consumerism. Our Christianity today is cheap because we don't know the Lord. We come not to worship. Or should we worship? We don't understand what is worship. It's a consumer, it's a business transaction. Lord, I do this, you do this for me. But once you understand who Jesus is, you give him your best. 
Look at what David did. You know David? Because he understood worship, he understood the value of God. David said, when he was building the temple in the same place, okay, he was going to build the temple in that place where he bought. The temple is not for man, but for the Lord. Everybody read. Now, with all my ability, I provided for the house of my God the gold, the things of gold, silver, the things of silver, bronze, the things of bronze, iron, wood, onyx stones, inlaid stones, antimony, stones of various colors, all kinds of precious stones, and alabaster. David said, in my love for the Lord, I provided with all my ability, said to me, with all my ability. That is worship. Notice. Everybody read. In my delight. For him, it's a delight. It's not a duty. In my delight, in the house of my God, the treasure I have of gold, silver, I have given I give it to the house of my God, over and above all that I've already provided. David was very generous in his giving. People ask me, how can you tell if somebody is really worshiping God? I have three tests. Your time, your treasure, and what do you do with your talent? What do you do with your life? For David, he said, I gave 3,000 talents of gold, 7,000 talents of refined silver. Do you know how much this is? I asked my banker friend to give me a rough computation, and our own staff did the computation. This is so shocking. David gave, David's giving was four, was five billion dollars. Five billion dollars. Plus the people they gave Nine billion. You know, for the temple of God, it is the most expensive building ever built in history. How much was it? 14 billion. On a per square meter basis, nothing would beat the cost of God's temple up to today. You know why? For David, it's not a waste of money, it's not extravagance. You see, when you love God, you give. And David understood God. Oh, Lord, everything I'm giving you, all of this abundance that we have provided to build your house for your holy name, it's from you, Lord. It's yours. Can I tell you something? Last year, in December, somebody talked to me. Maybe someday I can announce to you his name, but I have not asked permission. He told me, Peter... I have a building somewhere in the uh, Mall of Asia. I'm going to give it to CCF for worship. 2,000 square meter for worship. <laughs> we don't have to pay anything. And then this year, somebody from Davao signed an agreement to donate over 2,000 square meter of prime property in Davao for CCF to build a new facility. <laughs> I realized something about people who have a close encounter with God. They know everything we have is from God. And out of their love for God, they become generous. You see, it will impact your entire life. Look at what the psalmist said. The psalmist said, because of who God is, worship means what? It will do something with your life. Oh, come. Let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout. I want you to notice the pronoun. Let us, let us, let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout for joy. Let us shout joyfully to him. For the Lord is a great God, a great king above all. Notice, worship is contagious. It's always with other people. In the Bible, you have private worship and you have public worship. Let me give you another example. Everybody read. Praise the Lord. Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. I will give thanks to the Lord with all my heart. Everybody read. In the company of the upright and in the assembly. Notice, everybody read. 
praise the Lord, sing to the Lord a new song. His praise in the congregation of the godly ones. Why am I bringing this up? I have nothing against live streaming. I have nothing against people thinking that they are worshiping in the privacy of their bedroom. However, I have a question. If you just live stream a message, that's not worship. You are listening to a message. It's okay. There's nothing wrong. But if you want worship, sing with God's people. My question to you is this. If a place is accessible to you, why will you not go with the people of God? Is it because it is not convenient? Well, if worship is dependent on whether it is convenient or not, then you diminish the value of whom you are worshiping. Think about it. What is your attitude on a Sunday? See, I get excited on a Sunday. I come to the house of the Lord with other people to worship. In fact, Tim Keller said something very insightful. He got this from C.S. Lewis. Because C.S. Lewis is saying, <clears throat> worship together. You will never know God as he is unless you are in a worshiping community. Individual worship is a preparation for corporate worship, which is the real transforming experience. Private worship is important. I worship God privately. But on a Sunday, when it's God's time for people to gather together, I worship. The reason is simply this. I value the Lord. And I want to show Him. I love Him. I can show my love many ways. So, practical suggestion. How do you now develop this habit of worship? As you worship, you become more intimate. As you become more intimate, you worship some more. It's called system. As James Clear said, you do not rise to the level of your goals. All of us have goals. All of you want to be intimate with God, I know. You fall to the level of your system. What do I mean? Let me give you an example. I'm going to help you. For me, to develop habit of worship, the first thing I do in the morning, remember all of us have habits. 60% of your behaviors are all habits. The only problem is this. Are they good habits? Are they bad habits? You have to identify your habits. Some of them are bad habits. It's subconscious, but you keep repeating it. And some habits are going to destroy you eventually. You see, bad habits do not impact you immediately. Eating bad food one day, one week, two weeks, it seems to be okay. After one year, after two years, after five years, after 10 years, you see the cumulative compounding effect of bad habits. Affect your kidney, affect your liver, affect your heart. The same thing with spiritual habits. You don't see the impact immediately, but you keep doing it. So in my case, for many years, I get up in the morning, I brush my teeth. Remember? After brushing my teeth, what do I do? It's a habit. I kneel down on my bed. I pray. It's a habit I've developed. And after praying, I get my audio phone to listen to Bible verses. To meditate on God's Word, I exercise. I walk and I listen. And then I take a shower. And then I go to my computer. If I, can, if I have insight of what I've heard, I look at the Bible again. It's a habit that I've done for many years. Let's talk about money. I've developed a habit. I told my office, it's a system. This is for tithing. At least 10%. CCF is already there. It's tithing. Over and above that, I've, my wife has a fund. It's called benevolent fund. It's for something else. It's a system we've developed. Because intimacy with God is fantastic. It's a goal. But what's a system to help you? So it affects my quiet time every day. I pray every day. I have a system. I memorize Bible verses. I read the memory verses every day as much as possible. I, I remember them. My giving is a system. Scheduling every week. 
I already scheduled a night where I meet with my D group. I have another D12. I scheduled that already. It's all in the schedule. It's a system. On Sunday, oh my goodness, on Sunday, you prepare by Saturday night. Your clothes are laid out. What you will wear. What my son did, he was sharing, no cell phone beside his bed every night, no cell phone. In the morning, no cell phone. It's a system. You sleep early on Saturday, so by Sunday you are ready for worship. Do you understand? It's a system. And because we have developed this for many years, the impact is there to see. The impact on my family, all of them, they go to worship. Their family put Christ first. It is something we have developed. You see, your habit eventually will make you. Your habit eventually shape you. So today I challenge you, make one habit. Practice one habit. Can I suggest? Early in the morning, make it a habit to spend time with the Lord. Do one habit that will contribute to the one ultimate goal that you want. Intimacy with God. But start with one habit, then two habits. And do it every day, every year. And you will see the impact. You know, David ended Psalm 27. He ended Psalm 27 with this amazing verse. Because it's a habit for him to be intimate with God in the midst of danger. Look at what he said. I would have despaired unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. He said, I would have been depressed. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Do you know waiting on the Lord is part of worship? Many of you are sometimes having problems and you're discouraged. Seek intimacy with God. To seek intimacy with God is to learn to wait upon Him. You see, David said, I would have been discouraged unless I really believed I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Do you believe God is good? Worship Him. Seek Him in good times, in bad times. Wait for Him. Take courage. Make it a habit. And that has been my habit. It is now a habit of seeking God in good times, in bad times. Whatever it is, it's a default mode in my life. Good times, bad times, I seek after God. I start in the morning. Let's bow our heads and pray. As your heads are bowed down, the choir will sing a song. As the choir sings that amazing song of surrendering all, I want you to make that your prayer. Some of you have never really made that choice, make that commitment. I want to seek intimacy. Today you can do it and you can experience intimacy as long as you are sincere. Are you willing to sincerely pray this prayer? Lord, today I want to seek you with all my heart. If you are willing to be sincere and pray that prayer sincerely, will you raise your hands? All right. You make that your prayer right now. As you make that prayer, then you sing this song from your heart. But let's pray first. Lord Jesus, I am making a commitment. I need your help. Like David, I ask you, Lord, to help me to seek intimacy with you. Today, with all my heart, I sincerely want to seek you with all my heart to be intimate with you. Help me to start at least with one good habit of meeting you every morning, Lord, every day, even just for 15 minutes, 10 minutes. But Lord, help me to develop good habits. In Jesus' name we all pray. Amen and amen. God bless you.